The Witch of Blackbird Pond, Chapter 11 Midsummer heat lay heavily upon the Connecticut Valley. The bare feet of the children were covered with fine, dry dust from the road. Inside the kitchen, the small body squirmed on the hard benches, and I strayed from the primers to gaze through the door at the forbidden sunshine. Kit felt as restless as her pupils. If only I could be like Mercy, Kit thought. When her own voice rose in exasperation, she was ashamed, remembering Mercy's unfailing patience. Watching Mercy this morning, she thought again soberly of the words that Mercy had spoken earlier in the summer. There had been a rare afternoon when Judith had invited Kit to go with some of the other girls of the town to pick flowers and picnic along the shore of the river. At the last moment, Kit had turned back to Mercy and cried impulsively, If only you could go too, Mercy. How can you bear it, always staying behind? And Mercy had answered serenely, Oh, I settled that a long time ago. I remember it very well. Father had carried me to the doorstep, and I sat there watching the children playing a game in the road. I thought of all the things I would never be able to do, and then I thought about the things that I could do. Since then, I've never thought much about it. Teaching the children was certainly something that Mercy could do, with love and skill. And yet, Kit often wondered, what was it worth? All this work to master their letters? She herself had been eager to learn, scarcely able to wait to open the wonderful volumes in Grandfather's library. But most of these children would never even imagine the adventure that words could mean. Here in New England, books contained only a dreary collection of sermons, or at most some pious religious poetry. Sighing, Kit glanced over the docilely bent heads of her charges toward the open doorway, and as she did so, a sudden motion caught her attention. She moved quickly. I'm sure someone is out there again, she thought. Today I'm going to find out. Yes, for the third time, a little bunch of flowers, buttercups and wild geraniums, lay on the doorstep. As she bent to pick them up, she was certain that a shadowy figure slipped behind a tree. Curiosity made her forget her pupils, and stepping into the road, she saw the small figure plainly and recognized Prudence Kroof. Prudence, she called. Don't run away. Is it you left the flowers? The child came slowly from behind the tree. She was thinner than ever, clad in a shapeless sack-like affair tied about her middle. Her eyes, much too big for her pinched little face, gazed at Kit with longing. She reminded Kit of a young fawn that had wandered near the house one morning. It had drawn nearer just like this, quivering with eagerness at the food Mercy set out, yet tense to spring at the slightest warning. Who are the flowers for, Prudence? You. The child's voice was nothing but a hoarse whisper. Thank you. They're lovely. But why don't you come into school with the others? I'm too big, stammered Prudence. You mean you know how to read already? Nah. Pa wanted me to go to school, but Ma says I'm too stupid. You don't really believe that, do you, Prudence? A bare toe dug into the dirt of the roadway. I don't know. I can hear you when the door is open. I bet I could learn as good as them. Of course you could, and you ought to. Why don't you come in with me right now and see how easy it is? Prudence shook her head violently. Somebody'd tell on me. What if they did? Maud cane me. I'm not supposed to speak to you. Remembering Goodwife Kroof's hard, thin mouth, Kit did not urge. Prudence, she suggested instead. You could learn to read by yourself if you really wanted to. 
I haven't any horn. Kit remembered something. Is there a place where you could meet me where no one would tell on you? She asked. Can you get to the meadows? Prudence nodded. Nobody cares where I go, just so as I get the work done, she said. Then if you'll try to meet me there this afternoon, I'll bring you a horn book and I'll teach you to read some of it. Will you come? If I get finished, Prudence breathed. You know the path that leads from South Road over to Blackbird Pond? Prudence gulped. The witch lives down there. Don't be silly. She's a gentle old woman who wouldn't harm a field mouse. Anyway, you don't need to go that far. There's a big willow tree just down the path. I'll wait for you there. Will you try? The struggle behind those round eyes hurt to watch. Maybe, whispered Prudence, and then she turned and ran. Kit walked slowly back into the schoolroom. What excuse could she make to get into her trunks today? At the bottom of one of them, she had remembered, was a little horn book. It had been a present brought from England by friends of her grandfather's. It was backed by silver filigree, underlaid with red satin, and had a small silver handle. She had never really used it. She remembered how she had astonished the visitors by reading every letter straight off. But she had cherished the gift for its delicate craftsmanship. What a pity every child couldn't learn to read under a willow tree, Kit thought a week later. She and Prudence sat on a cool, grassy carpet. A pale green curtain of branches just brushed the grasses and threw a filigree of shadows as delicate as the wrought silver on the child's face. This was the third lesson. At first, Prudence had been speechless. In all her short life, the child had seldom seen, and certainly never held in her hands, anything so lovely as the exquisite little silver horn book. For long moments, she had been too dazed to realize that the tiny alphabet fastened to it was made up of the same A's and B's and AB's that she had overheard through the school doorway. But now, by this third meeting, she was drinking in the precious letters so speedily that Kit knew she must soon find a primer as well. "'Tis getting late, Prudence. I don't want you to get into trouble, and I must go back too." The child sighed and held out the horn book obediently. <sighs> That is yours, Prudence. I meant it for a present for you. She'd never let me have it, the little girl said regretfully. You'll have to keep it for me. Kit made a decision. She'd been wanting an excuse to take Prudence to Hannah. She had a feeling that the child needed that comforting refuge even more than she did herself. I know what we'll do, she suggested. We'll leave the book here with Hannah. Then any time you want to use it, you can come and get it from her. Terror blanched the child's face. Prudence, listen to me. You're afraid of Hannah because you don't know her and because you've heard things that just aren't true. She'll cut off my nose if I go near her. Kit laughed, then took the child's hands in her own and spoke as earnestly as she knew how. You trust me, don't you? The small head nodded solemnly. Then come with me and see for yourself. I promise you, on my honor, nothing will hurt you. The bony hand in hers was trembling as they walked down the grassy path, but Prudence stepped resolutely beside her. Kit's heart ached suddenly with pity and gratitude at such trust. I brought another rebel to visit you, she announced as Hannah came to the door. Hannah's pale eyes twinkled. What a wonderful day, she exclaimed. Four new kittens and now visitors. Come and see. Under a corner of the cabin on a pile of soft grass, 
the great yellow cat curled protectively around four tiny balls of fluff. Her topaz eyes glowed up at them, and her purr was boastful. Completely disarmed, Prudence went down on her knees. Oh, the dear little things, she whispered, reaching one reverent finger. Two black ones, one striped and one yellow one. Over her head, Kit and Hannah smiled. If thee is very, very careful, thee can pick one up and hold it, Hannah told her. With a black kitten cradled in her hands, Prudence watched them find a safe corner for the horn book. Thee is welcome any time, child. I'll keep it safe for thee. Now show me what thee has learned today. What letter is this? In the clean white sand on the floor, Hannah traced a careful bee. Looking at Prudence, Kit held her breath, but there was no trace of fear in those fawn-like eyes as Hannah held out the stick. Boldly, Prudence reached to take it in her own hand, and carefully and proudly, she traced the lines herself. I believe there must be a morsel of blueberry cake for such a smart pupil, praised Hannah. The morsel of cake vanished in a twinkling. Hannah's magic cure for every ill, Nat had said. Blueberry cake and a kitten. Kit smiled to see it working its charms on Prudence. But there was an invisible ingredient that made the cure unfailing. The Bible name for it was love. Why do they say she's a witch? Prudence demanded as the two walked slowly back along the path. Because they've never tried to get to know her. People are afraid of things they don't understand. You won't be afraid of her now, will you? You will go to see her when you can, even if I'm not there? The child considered. Yes, she said finally. I'm going back first chance I get. Not just because the horn is there. I think Hannah is lonesome. Of course she has the cat to talk to, but don't you think sometimes she must want somebody to answer back? And I think we'll stop there for now and continue in the next video. In the meantime, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thank you so much for watching. I love you guys. Bye-bye.